Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you to our inaugural series of SFS Online and On Topic. This is sponsored by the Georgetown University Alumni Association in conjunction with the Walsh School of Foreign Service. And over the next several weeks, we will be bringing in distinguished faculty members like Professor Stanley, who is with us here today, and distinguished alums to talk about some of the most current challenging issues of our time. So today, it is a great honor to introduce my friend, my colleague, Professor Liz Stanley. Professor Stanley, as many of you know, teaches in the Walsh School of Foreign Service and the Department of Government. She is a scholar of so many different areas, security studies, mindfulness. She did her undergraduate degree at Yale University. She earned her MBA from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and she earned her PhD from Harvard University. Before entering academia, Professor Stanley was an intelligence officer in the United States Army, leaving with the rank of captain. We have been fortunate to have her at Georgetown University, I would say for a few years, but, but she's a mainstay at Georgetown. She has published widely in the field of security studies, and as I mentioned, mindfulness, and that really relates to the topic of today's webinar. Most recently, she has published a book entitled Widen the Window, Training Your Brain and Body to Thrive During Stress and Recover from Trauma. Today, Professor Stanley is going to be talking about building resilience during a time of COVID-19, during the time of the coronavirus. Now, the way we're going to work is I'm going to turn it over to Professor Stanley. She is going to present for a bit, and then we're going to move into the Q&A mode. What I would ask you to do, and you can feel free to do this during her conversation, is in the questions function on your control panel, which you have by you there on the webinar, go ahead and type in your questions. And then Kelly Young of the Alumni Association will collect those questions. And when we get to the Q&A time, she will ask those questions and Professor Stanley will respond. So let's get started. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Elizabeth Stanley. Thank you so much, Tony, and thank you all for joining us today. It is my great pleasure to spend some time with you this afternoon. Um, as Tony said, uh, I am a professor in the security studies program and in the de government, de government department, but um, this project kind of grew from my own experience. There is nothing that I teach related to resilience that I haven't learned from directly in my own mind and body. Um, like many people, I experienced childhood adversity and then um, shock trauma events, uh, a near-death experience while I was in Bosnia. And while I was in graduate school, um, was diagnosed with PTSD and depression and was coping with lung problems after my near-death experience. So I was dealing with a tremendous stress load that had been accumulating in my body for decades, and I had to learn a new way to handle it. And in the course of my journey, I did some clinical training in body-based trauma techniques, but I also created a resilience training program. And we spent the last decade collaborating with neuroscientists and stress researchers to look at its effects. Um, this program is, and all the research that I've done along the way come together in the book. Um, and you know, I share my story and some other people's stories, and I'd like to share, distill some pieces of it today for coping with stress and anxiety during this time of COVID. Um, so the window, which is in the title, is the window of tolerance that each of us have wired to stress in our minds and bodies. When we're inside our window, we are able to keep all of our decision-making and planning um, functions online. We're able to stay socially connected with other people, and we're able to access choice so that we make the best decisions possible. People who have wider windows have more capacity to tolerate uncertainty, which is clearly something going on right now. And everybody's window is wired throughout their life, during childhood and then through repeated experiences. And this point is really important because I'm going to come back to it many times in our discussion today. Whatever we are doing on a repeated way 
consciously or unconsciously, is having tremendous effects on our mind and body. And for many of us, we don't think about um, what we're doing on a regular basis in the ways that it's affecting our mind and body. So I want to sort of get a sense of the group uh, before we get much further. And I have a couple polls for us to do that. Um, this first poll is to get a sense of what is causing the most stress for you right now. And you should be seeing that poll come up on your screen. Please um, take some time to select which of these might be bothering you. Um, COVID-19, your health or the health of your loved ones, job uncertainty, maybe job loss or the economy, being stuck at home, having to unexpectedly homeschool your kids or attention in close relationships while you're stuck at home, or loneliness and social isolation. Please take a moment to vote um, and give us a sense of how things are going for you. All of these are things that can cause lots of problems. And that clearly is a case here. So about half of the group is finding um, the, the virus itself to be a stressor. About half are finding health of their own health or the health of their loved ones to be a problem. About half, 46% are worried about their job or the economy more broadly. A quarter of you are worried about being stuck at home or tension at home and homeschooling. And about a third are coping with loneliness and social isolation. These are constant stressors that many of us are coping with and we need new ways to work with it. So I'd also like to get a sense of how this stress is manifesting for you right now. So I have one more poll just to get a sense of that. What kinds of things you're noticing as you are coping with all of these things. Are you feeling worried or anxious or overwhelmed? Are you feeling distracted and having a hard time concentrating and focusing? Are you feeling irritated and restless, like you want to jump out of your skin or impatient? Are you dealing with physical symptoms like sleep problems or gastrointestinal problems or other physical symptoms like chronic pain or headaches? Or have you been relying heavily on stress habits like increasing your alcohol use or other substances, binging television, procrastinating, um, and other things that actually can add to stress? How is your stress manifesting right now? Okay, so more than half are feeling anxious and worried, 56%. 60% are noticing distractedness and lack of focus. Half are feeling impatient, irritated, and restless. About a little more than a third are dealing with physical manifestations of stress, like sleep issues or gastrointestinal problems. And about four out of 10 are dealing with um, stress habits, like TV binging and incre increased alcohol and other ways that we cope to feel better in the short term but that actually add to our stress over the long term. Okay, thank you so much for helping me have a sense of how we are coping together. You know, it's interesting because most of us identify with the part of our brain that we hear on a regular basis as a running commentary in our head. In the book, I talk about this as the thinking brain. It's the newest parts of our brain and it's what's responsible for decision-making, for paying attention, for concentration, um, all those executive functioning capacities that come with paying attention. Explicit memory, it's what lets us anticipate and plan and consciously remember. And our thinking brain is also what controls willpower. Most of us know that little running commentary in our head and that's you know when we're having thoughts, it's the thinking brain that's engaged. And many of us identify with that part of our brain and we try to use that part of the brain to help ourselves feel better. Interestingly though, that part of the brain is not what turns stress on and it's not what turns stress off. And as we're gonna talk about today, there's a paradox some of the things we do to help that part of our brain feel more comfortable during COVID is actually going to make our stress worse, okay? So that part of the brain gets degraded 
whenever we're experiencing prolonged stress or where, uh, whenever we're experiencing traumatic stress, when we're feeling helpless and powerless and lacking control, which is very common right now. So that part of the brain is gonna be degraded. For all of you who are having problems with distraction and, and difficulty focusing, that's because your thinking brain is in this kind of degraded place during chronic stress right now. The other part of the brain, in the book I talk about it as the survival brain, these are the evolutionarily older parts of our brain, and they are responsible for all of the basic functioning that keeps our body going, like breathing and circulation and functioning our organs. But that part of the brain is also responsible for recognizing when stress is present. It's the part of the brain that's always looking around to see, you know, is something threatening right now or challenging? And if it finds something threatening or challenging, it turns stress on. This is also the part of the brain that turns stress off. So helping the survival brain to feel safe is super important because that's what lets us turn stress off. Moment ago, I said that one of the weird things about COVID is the things we're choosing to do to help our thinking brain feel calmer are actually making it worse for our survival brain. So, our thinking brain, the way it tries to protect us and keep us safe, is it tries to anticipate and predict and prevent unwanted things from happening. It doesn't like uncertainty. And so whenever it doesn't have enough information, it wants to gather more information. First, it will try and compare whatever's happening right now to times in the past and then project those past things into the future. Of course, global pandemics have not happened in our lifetimes. <laughs> so our thinking brains don't have a whole lot of experience that we can go back and draw from. So when that happens, the thinking brain gets anxious and it starts worrying. You have all those little thoughts going in your head. What if, what if, what if? Every kind of what if thought will lead you to then take certain actions. And the thinking brain is going to crave information. This is the reason why you might be feeling addicted to having to be on your social media feed all the time or having to pay attention to the news and have the news on 24 seven, waiting for that next little hit, reading the next study about what's going on and am I gonna be safe? And am I going to be able to get what I need? And all of those things that the thinking brain is doing to help itself feel calmer guess what? They're actually making it worse for the survival brain. Because any time we have a what if thought, or any time we pay attention to information that might be perceived as threatening or challenging, such as seeing all of these people wearing protective uh, equipment or reading the death counts or all of the different information we're gathering, this is leading the survival brain to feel unsafe. And the survival brain starts turning stress on. And that manifests as physical sensations and as anxiety and irritation. Um, and over time, when we've turned stress on and we've not turned it off, we build a stress load. And that's what leads to all of the different symptoms that we can experience. It might be those stress habits we rely on, it might be panic attacks or anxiety. It might be sleep problems or stomach issues or chronic pain. All of these things happen when our survival brain has turned stress on and we've never turned it off. So only the survival brain gets to decide when we're turning stress off. Even though we've been doing these things to try and help ourselves feel better, it's actually making it worse for our survival brain. And that's why we really need to help support the survival brain in feeling safe. And I have eight chapters in the book that lay out how to do that, but I'm going to give you just a distilled bit of it right here. I'm going to repeat something I said before. Whatever we're doing in a repeated way, consciously or unconsciously, it's having tremendous ripple effect through our brain and our body. Most of us aren't paying attention to those racing thoughts that are there that are constantly happening or paying attention to the fact that when we're watching the news, it's leading us to have our heart rate increase or get sweaty palms. But all of that 
It's just having these ripple effects, turning stress on. So whatever we're doing in a repeated way matters. And that means habits really matter. That is one place that we can really intervene to help widen our window of tolerance, to help our survival brain to recover. Um, I have one more poll I'd like to ask you all about your beliefs and experience with habits. Um, and that one's coming up right now. So which answer here, you're just gonna pick one, best characterize your relationship with habits? Do you never have think about your habits? Do you wish you had better habits, but believe that changing them isn't worth the effort? Do you try to set good intentions and change your habits, but then you stumble on the follow through? Or do you find habit change to be easy? Please pick one. Okay. Well, luckily there's not many people here who've never thought about their habits. That's wonderful. And there, that's only 2%, only 1% don't think habit change is worth the effort. About one in 10 think habit change is easy and I'm glad for that. But the overwhelming majority of you, 88%, feel like you set good intentions to change habits but then stumble on the follow through. So, I'd like to, in just a couple more minutes, talk about some habit changes you might want to make because habits are so important for our resilience. And in some ways, one of the most important points from neuroscience about habits is that habit change is easiest when we have some kind of exogenous shock to the system and our existing routines get interrupted. Well, guess what? <laughs> We've all had our existing routines seriously interrupted, which means that there is at least one silver lining to coronavirus. And that is we are in this wonderful experiment, choice point time, to make new habit changes. Every repeated experience is having impact and you can make some good choices right now. You've had everything thrown up in the air. This is the time to make new habits. In the book, I talk all about how to do a diagnostic of your habits and then change some. But two key points to keep in mind right now is habit change will be best affected by what you do at the beginning. So whatever you want to do, set the conditions well at the start. If you want to make a habit change with your diet, totally clean out all the old stuff so it's not in the house and start fresh, for example. And the second big thing to keep in mind, you need to have accountability and support and decide what that is for you, whether that's you're going to do it with an accountability buddy, like a workout buddy, whether you're going to text someone once you've committed to something that day, um, whether you join a small group and check in with each other on a regular basis. This is one of the reasons why AA is so helpful for people that are overcoming their alcoholism because it provides both accountability and support. So those are some things to keep in mind. And these are the window widening habits, a little drum roll here. The first one that's most important for helping the survival brain recover, getting enough sleep. And that means at least eight hours every night. We do a tremendous amount of recovery during sleep while the thinking brain is off dreaming the survival brain and body can do all kinds of tissue repair and toxin elimination and pruning in the brain that's really important for our health. Second is getting enough physical exercise. Um, and that means at least three times a week, 30 to 45 minutes of raising your heart rate, as well as some stretching. Um, we do a lot, uh, a lot of our gen gene expression is affected by our habits and exercise really affects the gene expression around our metabolism and around our inflammation levels. And during this disease, we do not want to have high inflammation levels. Third big habit change to keep in mind is paying attention to your diet and the microbiome, all of those little, you know, trillions of flora that live in our digestive tract. If you're not eating enough probiotics, definitely do that. Um, and you can also really take care by taking out 
of your diet, the things that upset and imbalance the microbiome, things like sugar, alcohol, too many pain medications. Those are some of the biggies. Trans fats, processed foods are the last kind of big ones in the five. We produce 95% of serotonin, which is the neurotransmitter involved in sleep and anxiety and depression in our gut. And 70% of our immune system is also in our gut. So you could use this time to really clean up your diet. Fourth window widening habit is social connections. Even while we're doing social distancing, it's really important to be staying in touch with people, video conferencing and phone calls. Emails don't count. You need actual contact where your system can resonate with someone else's system. Um, in contrast, when we're lonely, it actually has been shown to lead to more inflammation in the mind and body. Fifth thing to keep in mind, we resonate with our environment. So being in regulated environments with regulated people and or with nature, nature is regulated. Very, very helpful for our minds and bodies. As you can see, I have lots of plants in my house for this reason. It really helps to solve and um, help our body regulate naturally. It just happens from this environmental impact. In contrast, when we're with our electronics of any form, that is dysregulated for our mind and body. And the last habit um, is really training our attention in ways to help the survival brain feel safe. Um, I would be happy to lead you in a short exercise, but I know I've run a little long here. So we'll see how we're doing on questions maybe before we get there. But you can download a five minute audio exercise from my website. It's called Contact Points to train your attention so that your survival brain can recover. These are some basic habits, a lot more about them in the book, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Liz, that was fantastic. That was fantastic. And now I know I have to go out and get the book. So or, or not go out and get the book, I have to order the book and have it delivered is, is what I need to do. Uh, ex extremely well articulated, but also some basic things that I think too many of us probably don't think about and tend to neglect. And yes. I just want to highlight one point you made, which is so important because we are at such an unusual period in time and we have this exogenous challenge to our lifestyle, it's an amazing time to create these new habits. Yes, yes. And then they'll have momentum so that when you go back to life outside of being sheltered in place, they will have momentum. Momentum is really important. And so this is a, we've had this exogenous shock and then we'll get new momentum with the new habits. And, and I find even myself, these are just little habits that I have already changed that have made me feel much better and much better mm -hmm. regulated that I was not observing uh, prior to COVID-19. Uh, okay, let me, let, let me see. Uh, Kelly, do we have any folks asking questions in the question section of their uh, control panel yet? We do. We have a number of questions coming in. Um, many are actually compliments um, for, for addressing these um, issues and a lot of questions as to where to order your book, um, which we can surely include in our follow up email. Um, yes. So let's get to some of the other questions. Uh, are resilience and grit opposite qualities? <laughs> That's a great question. Are resilience and grit opposite qualities? Well, I have a whole chapter in the book where I talk about um, our social value on grit as something that we really want. And grit is defined, there's a whole literature around it. Um, grit is defined as the ability to have a goal and keep going despite adversity. That is certainly one aspect of resilience. What's interesting about the grit literature though, is it focuses very much on this ability to keep going and then all of the external benefits that come from that, um, you know, with job success or relationship success or um, completing school and education. But the grit literature doesn't look at all at its costs. And so I have a chapter in the book that looks at this social norm that we have around pushing through. 
pushing through during an extreme situation is a really good thing to be able to do. Um, that's one of the reasons why so many high stress professions select for and train for grit. But the downside with grit is that it is teaching our minds and bodies to turn stress on and never turn stress off. And so then we have all of these other effects of narrowed windows. And the statistics in our country of narrowed windows are really intense. For many people, it comes out sideways in their bodies with chronic pain or physical health issues. And we don't connect the dots that the way that we're living in this gritty pushing through way is leading to these effects. I mean, I was exhibit A of that in my own life. So we want to be able to be gritty when we need to, but we also need to be able to help our system to recover back to its baseline so that we have the strongest well-being possible. Grit is a subset of resilience, but it's not resilient. Okay, great. Um, another question. Can you share with us a bit more about how your framework MMFT has been applied to the US military? What difference do you see between military resilience needs and the rest of the general population? That's a great question. So MFIT, Mindfulness-Based Mind Fitness Training, and we pronounce the acronym MFIT. If you're gonna work in a high-stress environment, you gotta have an acronym. So um, MFIT is uh, an, normally taught as an eight-week course, um, 20 hours of training, and then practicing exercises to train attention and re-regulate the mind and body about half an hour a day. Um, and I have, the first exercise of it, you can get on my website, and we've just finished filming for an online version of MFIT that will be available in October. So if you want to do the whole course, you're going to have an opportunity to do that. In our research, we found that the men and women that we trained, compared to men and women who weren't getting MFIT or who got another training that was positive psychology based, the MFIT trained troops um, saw improvements in cognitive performance, improvements in their perceived stress levels and in their mood. They were reporting better sleep, longer sleep duration, and less use of sleep um, aids and medications. They, we um, had them in bio harnesses during combat drills and before the stressor of doing combat drill in an ambush, they went to a faster arousal of stress, went to a higher peak, but then recovered much more quickly, which is the sign of a wide window that we can have a lot and tolerate a lot of stress in our minds and bodies, but then fully recover. And they also saw improvements in the biomarkers, the key blood biomarkers of resilience and immunity. So lots of shifts just from practicing these exercises on average 30 minutes a day. And many of them weren't practicing that whole amount. Um, some of them were only practicing 10 minutes, it turned out from, from their uh, logs that they were keeping. So we can train this um, and clearly preparing for a combat deployment is stressful. What I have found in teaching in other environments, including a course I teach at Georgetown um, that has had lots of different graduate students and undergraduates um, in SFS, is that the mind and body um, that is in a high achieving environment like Georgetown is coping with just as much stress arousal on a regular basis without recovery as the men and women who might be preparing for combat. So it's interesting. People often say to me, well, you know, I've never experienced combat or I've never experienced a rape or I've never, and then they, their thinking brain writes off whatever their own stressors are. When we do that, our thinking brain is setting it up for a bad relationship with our survival brain because our thinking brain is devaluing the source of our stress. It really doesn't matter what is causing our stress. As I lay out in the book, just the chronic everyday stressors like sleep deprivation or interestingly working in an office that doesn't have a door that you can close or having to care for a loved one, just things that we would write off as no big deal, if we are having stress without recovery, it is still leading to a stress load in our mind and body, 
just as if someone is preparing for deployment. So these techniques apply to all of us. We're all human. Wonderful, Liz. We have um, a number of questions about breaking bad habits and avoiding the uh, cycle of relapse. And so can you touch a bit on fluctuations in resilience and how to assess and adjust when we're not feeling as resilient as we might have in previous periods of extreme stress and, and that you know cycle with bad habits and they're, they're relapsing? Yeah, well, it's interesting, many of us try to use grit with our habits. Um, and we set the intention and then we wanna power through. And when we lapse, we get very upset with ourselves um, and you know, end up feeling ashamed or embarrassed or self-judgmental. All of those emotions are actually making it harder for our survival brain to stick with the habit. The way that habits work, we wire them initially by paying attention consciously. We make the choice and our thinking brain is involved. But over time, as we learn a habit and it becomes a habit loop, our brain is very adaptive. It pushes the habit process down into the survival brain. The survival brain runs the habit so that we can save our thinking brain capacity for other things. And that's why when we start having problems with our habits, we feel like we have fallen short, um, we you know, didn't live up to our intentions, that if our thinking brain starts judging that, it actually adds more stress to what's going on and that doesn't help the survival brain with the habit. So what I suggest doing is first setting good ground conditions because the beginning really matters with habits. And then second, to be able to treat the habit like an experiment in your own mind and body. And you might want to keep a little journal where you know, like, did, what, what did you want to do? Did you do it today? How did it feel? So that you can then go back and look and watch at how we might have ups and downs and then not take the ups and downs quite so personally because the way that we evolve, it is a bit of an expansion and contraction process. And when we, only, when we let our thinking brain identify with either the ups or the downs, it gets in the way of the survival brain having the repetitive nature that it needs for the habit to work. So that's one thing. The other thing to keep in mind with habits is that we often find that many of the things that we adopted kind of semi-consciously were fulfilling a really important need for our mind and body that we were never aware of. And so if we can become aware of and really investigate, you might like journal for a bit and inquire, what, where did this habit come from? What does it do for me? What is its function? that when we can do that, it can help us hold our behavior a little less judgmentally. And it also opens up some choices for substitutions that we can pick other things that might provide the same benefit, that might give us the same function, but that might not cause quite so much stress load building up on our minds and bodies. And I talk much more about that in one of the chapters of the book, but it's, it's a process, and the last thing I'll say on this, because so many of us rely on willpower as the way that we keep with good habit, when we're in chronic stress, our willpower is degraded, like any thinking brain function. Willpower is a thinking brain function. So whenever we're in chronic stress, our willpower is going to be degraded. That's when you really have to be kind with yourself. And remember, your neurobiology right now is stressed. You don't have a lot of willpower. That's when you need to focus on helping the survival brain get recovered so that you can have some willpower again in the future. Okay. All right. A couple of other questions more to um, specific situations. One, um, 
from an attendee who runs a college transition program for seniors in high school. Mm -hmm. How can she best support this age group's resiliency and success as this key life stage has been so disrupted? Yes, this is a really challenging time for everyone, but especially for teenagers who are graduating, they're feeling the loss of their graduation, they're feeling the anxiety of, am I going to actually get to go to college if that's what's going to happen? Am I going to have to be at home? I'm ready to move, but I don't know. And you know, we are wiring our nervous system and our thinking brain up until our 30s. So these adolescents don't have all of their thinking brain functions fully wired yet. It's harder for them to do some of the popular thinking brain techniques that we tend to collectively rely on, like noticing gratitude, finding the positive in a situation. These are some of the reframes that many of us use. Those are thinking brain techniques. They're not gonna be particularly easy to rely on right now, partly because it's so uncertain, partly because we're just all stressed. So one of the things I would suggest that you work with your um, students to do is to help them acknowledge how they're feeling and to help them see and let it be okay. You know, many of us aren't fully owning our emotions. And when we don't fully own the emotion, don't fully allow it into awareness, we often park it and compartmentalize it somewhere in our body. And it comes out kind of sideways, often in either anxiety or depression disorders, but often also in physical illness. We need to help everyone, but especially teens, to recognize it's okay to be feeling sad. It's okay to be feeling angry that you're not getting prom. It's okay to be feeling anxious that you don't know what's coming next. Because when we can allow that emotion fully in our awareness, and we help ourselves to let that emotional wave wash through our bodies, it actually helps us build our resilience. Anytime we experience an emotion and recover from it, that helps widen the window too. I have a chapter that looks at that process, but the most important thing that we as adults can do is really support non-judgmentally and allow that emotion, give it space and not judge them, not, but you know, let it be there and model in our own minds and bodies. It's okay that we're having this emotion. It's okay that they're having emotion. I think that's incredibly helpful, Liz. I, I know there are other um, attendees who are asking, you know, how to deal with them having their own stress, but then also their children being stressed through homeschooling. And I think that that's definitely applicable um, in the conversations that they can have with their children as well. Um, Absolutely. I, I sometimes will do podcasts for parents. And one of the common misconceptions that I get um, that I often have had as a question from parents or from podcasters who are speaking on behalf of parents, is parents have, many parents have this well-intentioned but slightly misguided idea that they need to constantly be showing this, that they have it all together, the sort of a stiff, stiff upper lip, that they're fine, um, and that they're, they're sort of showing that they have it together for their kid. But underneath, their mind and body might be very dysregulated because they themselves are feeling sad and anxious and angry or whatever else. What's interesting is even if on the surface they tell their kid things are fine and they kind of bottle it up while they're focusing on their child, their biology is still anxious and sad and all of those things. And the child's biology is unconsciously picking up on the parent's biology. There's this whole idea of stress and emotion contagion, and it's most, it's strongest in our loved ones' relationships, our attachment bonds, parent, child, and our romantic partners, or our own parents. And it's also really strong between teachers and students, between leaders and their followers, between bosses and subordinates, power difference relationships. So as parents, even if we're saying to the kid, it's fine, our bodies aren't saying that. 
And the child's survival brain is picking up on our body, not on what we're saying, not what our thinking brain is talking about. The child is picking up on the body. And if we keep pretending like it's all together, when that's going on underneath, it's actually a form of crazy making for the child. And it makes the child's survival brain that much more stressed. So it's really important for us to acknowledge. We don't have to act the emotion out, but to name it, I'm feeling sad right now. And, you know, I need a moment. And, you know, we're really sad together. This is really hard. What can we do to process that? and work with it that way so that it, it becomes part of their toolkit, that these emotions aren't off limits, but they're part of being human. Mm -hmm. In incredibly helpful. Again, um, we have time for just a few more questions. Um, there are a couple regarding your specific recommendations for one, those who live alone um, and who may be experiencing isolation and loneliness, um, and also people experiencing professional burnout. Yes. Um, so both of those are issues that we're coping with right now. For those uh, who are living alone, it is especially important that you prioritize some kind of social connection every day. Um, you might set up appointments, each of you cook dinner separately and have Zoom dinners together. You might um, get on the phone with some people. I've been doing a, a family Zoom dinner every Sunday night so that we have a chance to, to see my dad and, and the sisters all get together and can check in with him. Um, so having time where you're really making an effort to connect. If you used to go out for dinner with people, then continue to go out for dinner on your Zoom. If you used to um, do an art or craft with someone, you could you know, continue to do that hobby. It's hard when we're social distancing, there's no doubt, but it's really important for your mind and body to be having social connections. And this might also be a really great time to get a pet um, because we actually get a lot of nervous system connection from our pets. Um, so those are a couple things to think about. For burnout, Burnout, especially for those who are either having to do essential jobs right now or who happen to be working in the healthcare industry um, or in emergency response, I'm very grateful for what you are doing for us right now. And it is so important that you prioritize some kind of, of self-care every day. Um, I would say it's a bit of a triage when you're super burned out, but the most important one to consider is sleep. We do so much recovery function during sleep. Um, and if you, if you have a family, if you can kind of find a way to have some alone time that you schedule with your partner to keep the kids so that you have some space in some place in the house for yourself, that's really important. Um, the other thing with burnout is that when we're super burned out, that's when we tend to experience a lot of resistance. And so then we often will experience a lot of procrastination and it can begin to be this awful vicious loop of procrastination and then we get behind, so then we overwork and burn the midnight oil and then we're exhausted, so we procrastinate further. The, the only way out of that cycle is to build in some very conscious recovery time. And that may mean unplugging from everything for a day. Like, Do not watch the news, do not touch your phone, just spend some time taking a walk in nature. Um, you could sit by a tree. The tree, I know this sounds really strange, but sitting against the tree, very, very regulating for our minds and bodies. We can do that with social distancing. Um, and making sure that you are picking one thing that you are really focusing on for yourself. Many people in the helping professions tend to find self-care to be selfish, um, but it isn't. Um, I think of it like on the airlines, you put on your own, your own oxygen mask before helping others. And so if you are really burned out right now, please, prioritize this. This isn't selfish. It's actually helping to widen the collective window because you are in such an important role. Right? I'm conscious of the time here. And let me, Liz, this was 
amazing. And it was only 45 minutes. So everybody order Liz's book and read the book. You can also Google Liz and find TED Talks and other things that she has done. Extremely helpful. We really, really appreciate it. Let me, all of us give a, a virtual applause to Dr. Stanley here. And let me thank Kelly Young from the Alumni Association for, for putting things together, for organizing this. And a special shout out to Eleanor Jones, who is the Director of Alumni Relations with the School of Foreign Service. The idea of SFS online and on topic was her idea. We're gonna look forward to doing more of these in coming weeks. Finally, this has been recorded and the link will be available if you wanna to listen to it again or if you wanna send it to your friends. So I wanna thank everybody. Be safe, well, and Hoya Saxa. Hoya Saxa, thank you all for joining us today and may you be well.